Welcome to Rex number 101, and today we're talking about the effects of sawtooth riblets on low Reynolds number airfoils. So let's talk about, first of all, low Reynolds number airfoils. This is airfoils at low Reynolds number, so let's say below 100,000, and we're looking at sawtooth riblets. So riblets are a flow control device, which look like this. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see this in the video. If you're watching this on your Spotify, you can also see this in the video. If you're listening to this, then you can always download the paper and you can see some of the uh, riblets here. But anyway, let's discuss what these riblets are and where they come from and what they do. So the first thing is that th this actually comes from a shark skin and this is where riblets first came from. So if you look at a shark from far away, the skin looks smooth, but if you zoom into the skin, especially under a microscope, you'll see that it's actually very rough. And it's not just random roughness. It's actually, uh, there's method to the madness. So there are actually these ridges. And the shark skin, for those of you listening to this, imagine getting like a bunch of potato chips, you know, with the crinkle cut ones. And then you get all these potato chips and you tessellate them together. That's effectively what the shark skin looks like. And this is obviously under a microscope. And the reason why this is important is because it controls the flow. It actually controls the, um, the boundary layer, the subviscous boundary layer, to be more um, accurate, which means that it changes how the, the subviscous boundary layer acts, which reduces the friction drag and does this through different vortices and different actions, which we'll go through. So this is where the idea of riblets comes from. And there have been a lot of applications of riblets in the past, particularly on airfoils. And we'll talk about today how these riblets can be used to control the drag of an airfoil. And to do that, we're going to be looking at a paper called Numerical Study of Effect of Sawtooth Riblets on Low Reynolds Number Airfoil Flow Characteristics and Aerodynamic Performance. This is an open access paper, which you can find in the link in the description. So let's move on with the podcast. I'll zoom in a little bit so we can see a bit better. So they say riblets are applied to surfaces in fluid engineering, such as on aircraft wings, wind turbine blades, and boat surfaces. The most famous application in fluid engineering is the shark skin swimsuit which effectively reduces water resistance and increases swimming speeds by 3 to 7.5%. So this shark skin swimsuit, for those of you who remember back in like the 2004 Olympics, I believe, or maybe it was 2008, I don't remember exactly, but it was around that time. A lot of swimmers, for example, in freestyle, they were wearing these um, swimsuits, like these black sort of like um, wetsuit kind of looking things, but they had a special treatment to the outside and this is a shark skin so they had all these tiny little um, ridges which you can't see from with the naked eye but once you zoom in you can see it and these were very good in terms of the performance for the athletes because they could reduce the times by a lot and here they say reduce the water resistance so the water drag by up to 7.5 percent so that's a lot that's why they're potentially being banned because i think some athletes couldn't get access to them because of various um, sponsorship rights and blah, blah, blah. So I'm pretty sure they're still banned. But anyway, that was one of the first um, major applications that the world saw, but they've been used in a lot of different applications, for example, airfoils. So they say here, Gregory and others, other researchers, and then Beckert and other researchers experimentally investigated different shapes of the riblets. So not only just a typical ridge but all different types of shapes and the thin blade sawtooth scalped cross sections and shark skin shaped riblets were arranged so all these different types on a flat plate in an open channel an improvement in the drag reduction of six percent and seven percent were achieved by the sawtooth riblets and the scalp riblets respectively so in this paper we're going to be looking at sawtooth riblets and we'll cover what they look like in a little bit but we're going to cover a bit more what other researchers have done as well to get a better idea so who and others measured the three-dimensional turbulence of trapezoidal riblets and observed a skin friction reduction by 6.1%. So this is what I was mentioning earlier, how they reduce the drag is through the skin friction. And then some other researchers compared the flow fields of a V-shaped riblet and a thin blade riblet using DNS. So DNS is pretty much the best CFD, or the best numerical, um, Navier-Stokes numerical simulation methods that we have. Um, and then you need like very good computing power to do this, but they investigated these riblets and the thin blade riblets were found to produce a higher skin friction drag reduction than that of the V-shaped riblets, or about 3%. So in other words, the thin blade riblets were better at reducing skin friction drag by 3% compared to the V-shaped riblets. Moreover, some other researchers evaluated the drag reduction effect of the surface of sinusoidal riblets. So this is now a like a sine wave or cosine wave looking riblet. And I should probably mention how these riblets are typically placed on airfoils. 
before we go any further. So if you have a regular airfoil, which has a smooth surface, you can actually get like tape that has these riblet surfaces on there, or you can machine it onto the surface. But effectively, you just get this tape or whatever you're using, and you just paste it over the top. And you put it where you want it to, to go. So you can put it at the leading edge, you can put it at the trailing edge, you can put it at the maximum thickness or wherever. And this is just how they look. And often they'll put them... Um, there are different orientations that you can put them. Some put them longitudinally, so the, the riblet ridges are in line with the cord length. Others put them in the span-wise direction, so the ridge actually goes uh, perpendicular to the free stream velocity. And in this paper, we're looking at that latter one. So the riblet goes in the free stream, uh, perpendicular to the free stream direction. So with this senior sort of riblet, these reachers, via research on flat plates, they found that the drag reduction of riblets is achieved by reducing the intensity of the terminal boundary layer and the amplitude of the renal shear stress and vortical fluctuations. So the renal shear stress are just the, the stresses that come about due to the vo uh, velocity gradient in the, at the surface of the, of the object. So that's um, something that we often look at in CFD and we have like empirical data that we can draw upon or we can use other equations to determine what the renal shear stresses are. And they're very important to measure if you want to get accurate or to simulate, sorry, if you want to get better results. And they say that the riblets um, reduce these things potentially through the drag reduction. Some riblets don't, some riblets are bad, but if you design them properly, then you can get the skin friction drag reduction. So the studies on flat plates provide a clear understanding of the drag reduction characteristics and mechanisms of riblets. However, as the flow characteristics of the plate are relatively simple and different from the actual flow in real life, for example, it is inappropriate to directly apply the conclusions of plate flow studies to actual complex flows. Therefore, researchers have begun to investigate how riblets affect the fluid and aerodynamic properties of airfoils. A widely tested airfoil with riblets is the standard airfoil designed by the NACA um, committee called the NACA 0012. So NACA 0012 is a symmetrical airfoil with a 12% thickness to cord ratio. So it's a probably the most commonly the most commonly researched airfoil and um, tested airfoil in history. Han and uh, I guess Han by um, solely tested riblets on the NACA 0012 at a Reynolds number of 36,000 and observed a drag reduction of 16%. So 36,000 Reynolds number, depending on the terminus intensity, could be getting into the transitional range. So it may not be completely laminar flow. You may start to get, um, well, depending on the terminus intensity level, you could get something called the Thomas slitting waves, which are like these tiny little waves that start to propagate through and then break down three-dimensionally. Um, but if you have a very low terminus intensity, then you can just have completely laminar flow, really. So I'm not sure what um, type of boundary layer this would be, but it could potentially be transitional. And But they got a reduction of 16% in the drag. In addition, the airfoil that is common in wind turbine blades have, has also been arranged with riblets. So some researchers covered um, turbine blades, for example, with V-shaped riblets on a full-scale 2.5 megawatt wind turbine and produced a roughly 6% reduction in airfoil drag. Other researchers tested a DU96W180 airfoil. So this is a another very common uh, wind turbine airfoil. And if I'm not mistaken, this was actually developed by Delft University specifically for wind turbines. That's what the DU stands for. So anyway, they tested this airfoil with four different symmetrical V-shaped riblets, four different types. The best configuration significantly reduced the drag by 5%, but some riblets um, of other sizes increase the airfoil drag. So that's a potential trade-off that has um, a lot of air flow control devices have the power to make something better and has have the power to make things worse. Uh, it just depends on how you design them. So to further understand the drag reduction mechanisms on riblets, of riblets on airfoils, the influence of riblets on the flow structure near the airfoil surface is also um, something of interest that a lot of scholars have looked at. One particular researcher observed flow features caused by riblets um, at low speeds and found that the riblets were more effective under adverse pressure gradients. This is important because we talked about flat plates before. They're putting riblets on flat plates. Flat plates typically don't have adverse pressure gradients, at least not usually. You can get certain conditions where they do have them, but more importantly, airfoils almost always have adverse pressure gradients, really, even at a zero degree angle attack. At some point along the airfoil, you will start to get an adverse pressure gradient. So they're saying that riblets work better under these conditions. So that means that there's potential for riblets to be better on airfoils than flat plates. So Zhang and other researchers, other researchers, sorry, applied the, la the large eddy simulation method to simulate the mean velocity profile, the Reynolds shear stresses, 
around the airfoil. So large eddy simulation, LES, is effectively the second best Navier-Stokes um, approach to CFD. It's not as good as DNS, which we looked at earlier. So the results illustrated that the riblets thinned the boundary layer and the vortex structures were also weakened. So in other words, um, this is actually important. So when you squeeze a boundary layer, the tendency is that you really suppress the turbulent features. So for example, these they said there were vortical structures here. So when you th like thin a boundary layer, you're squashing them down and you're really like squashing them out of existence. So they're just breaking down now. And that's what happens when you thin a boundary layer. So anytime you do that, you're really promoting a laminar boundary layer. If you want to promote a turbulent boundary layer, you want to make this boundary layer grow as thick as possible so that these structures can just grow and break down in a uncontrolled manner, which then creates a lot of turbulence. And that really feeds that cycle to make a turbulent boundary layer. Thinning a boundary layer has the opposite effect, which they found here, which the riblets do. So that's pretty cool. So in this study, the effects of riblets on the resistance of a NACA 4412 airfoil are analyzed. So NACA 4412 airfoil is probably the second most um, commonly investigated airfoil in history. It's very similar to the NACA 0012, except it has camber. It has camber of 40% at a location of, um, sorry, 4% at a location of 40% from the leading edge. So this airfoil is asymmetric. Its shape and thickness distributions are similar to those of elementary stages of fan blades. So that's the potential application. Also, they're often used to approximate uh, airliner wings. So like a Boeing 747, for example, in addition, the Reynolds number of the airfoil is 100,000. So under this Reynolds number, regardless of the term intensity, you can pretty much say it's transitional. Like even if you have a term intensity of like 10%, you're probably still going to have a transitional flow here. It's not going to be completely turbulent. If you have a term intensity of like 0.1%, it's still going to probably be transitional. It's not going to be completely laminar. So this is in a very transitional range. So under these conditions, the blades of low pressure fans usually operate here. So referring to the study conducted by some researchers, uh, reference 10, and those on fans in references 23 and 24, the sawtooth riblets in the current study are arranged on the airfoil suction surface. It's on the top side in this case. The corresponding flow fields are calculated by steady direct simulation, so not transient, which is usually fine for airfoils, uh, depending on where you're looking at. But here is generally okay for steady simulations. The effect of riblets and the mechanisms on aerodynamic performance at various angles of attack are also detailed in um, below. So let's talk about the computational method. This is always important just to look at what they're doing. So they say the Reynolds number reflects the effect of the inertial forces on the viscous forces of a fluid. So that's true. So the Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertial forces compared to the viscous forces. The lower the Reynolds number, the more um, the viscous forces override whatever is happening in the flow. The higher the Reynolds number, the more the inertial forces override what's happening in the flow. So, for example, if you have a vortex, if you have a Reynolds number of one, for example, it means that the viscous forces are very strong compared to the inertial forces, which means that the vortex will break down much sooner than if you have a Reynolds number of, let's say, one million. If you have a Reynolds number of one million, then the vortex will start to propagate downstream much um, more readily because the inertial forces of that momentum of the the fluid moving around just continue and uh, viscosity cannot um, sap away its energy. So that's what the Reynolds number means. And this Reynolds number makes a flow, um, just the characteristics distinct in different phases. So for example, if you have Reynolds number, which is 10, for example, what happens here in a laminar range is quite different to what happens at a Reynolds number one, 1 million, for example. So with the wide use of low pressure fans in daily life in both homes and industry, Low Reynolds number flows are gradually playing a more crucial role. The airfoil is the most essential structure of the fan blade, where the aerodynamics of this airfoil has a great influence on the fan performance. So that makes sense. It is important to improve the stability of the airfoil at low Reynolds numbers by adopting an optimization strategy. Considering the fact that the flow angle varies under different working conditions, the turbulent flow over an ACA 4412 at angles of attack from 0 degrees to 12 degrees are considered as the basic flow in this study. So in other words, depending on the speed of the fan or the direction that like the angle of the blades or whatever, you can have different angles of attack happening in the blades. So 0 degrees to 12 degrees is what they're, they're investigating here. And the Reynolds number based on the airfoil cord length and the mean velocity is 100,000, uh, which is usual in civilian used fans.
So figure one shows the rivulets that they're looking at. So they have the NACA 4412 here at the zero degree angle attack. By the way, at zero degree angle attack, a NACA 4412 is still producing lifts because it's asymmetrical. And on top, they have the rivulets. So they have a few different parameters here. First of all, the cord is the length from the leading edge to the trailing edge. That's standard. The length of the rivulets that it covers is denoted with the symbol L. And they put this on the top surface and they put it, put it at about the midpoint of the cord. So about it starts at about 30% from the leading edge and ends up by about 70% from the leading edge. But this changes depending on what they're looking at. And then they have the riblets themselves. So the riblets, they are a sawtooth pattern, which means that they are just jagged and they're characterized by two different um, parameters. The first is H, which is the height of the riblets. And the second one is S, which is the wavelength of the riblets. So the distance between two peaks or two troughs. So H again, I'll just repeat that. H is the height of them. S is the distance between two adjacent riblets. So let's talk about the riblet design now. They say that the in this study, they designed sawtooth riblets with various lengths and heights. The cross-sectional shape of the riblets is an isosceles triangle with an apex angle of 53.1 degrees. So an isosceles triangle is a triangle with two equal length sides and then the third side is of a different length. And they're saying here that the, the angle of the peak is 53.1 degrees. So that's um, fairly sharp. And then some other researchers um, indicated that riblets with the dimensionless parameters of H plus is less than 25 and S plus less than 30 have a certain effect on reducing the friction drag of plates. So in other words, when these two parameters, which we'll get into in a second, when these two parameters are below a certain amount, that's when you start to get drag reductions on flat plates. Not airfoils, but flat plates. That's an important distinction to make, but potentially transferable between the two. We're not sure. So H plus and S plus are respectively defined as follows. H plus is H divided by K. H is the height of the sawtooth of the riblet. And K is a dimensionless wall coefficient, which is denoted by the kinematic viscosity divided by the wall friction visco velocity. Sorry. So that's a non-dimensional parameter. Um, and they have H plus defined as that. And this is very standard where you have, like, for example, Y plus to define as a boundary layer property as well, a dimensionless one. S plus, on the other hand, is the distance, so S divided by K. So S is the distance between two riblets. And again, K is that parameter of the kinematic viscosity divided by the wall um, friction velocity. So that's a non-dimensional uh, parameter there. So the height of the riblets, whose lengths vary from 5% of the cord to 80% of the cord is one millimeter. And the riblet schemes are named L05 to L80 for these ones. To gain further understandings of the relationship between the drag reduction and the riblet height on the airfoil, the heights of the riblets were also changed from 0.6 millimeters to 10 millimeters while keeping the length of the riblet section constant at 50% of the cord. So in other words, they have two different configurations. The first one is uh, when you keep the height of the riblets the same at one millimeter and you just change how much of the airfoil is covered by these riblets from 5% to 80%, L05 to L80. The second configuration is when you have the amount of the airfoil staying the same. So 50% of the airfoil is covered in these riblets, but the height of them change from 0.6 millimeters to 10 millimeters, sorry. So H06 to H100. So these are two different things they're looking at. Now, let's move on to the mesh modeling and validation. So in their CFD, they made the mesh a C-type algebraic one. So what does that mean? Let's look at these pictures here. So in figure two, they have the schematic of the calculation domain and they have the mesh showing. So the domain itself, you have the airfoil located um, about a third of the way towards the inlet. The Most of the domain, so the outlet and the um, top and bottom of the outlet, they are a typical rectangular yeah, cross-section, but the inlet is now circular. It's a semicircle. Now, why do you have a semicircle inlet? The reason why you have this is because you, you want to look at different angles of attack. So if you think about a regular domain, which, like a typical domain, which is rectangular, if you wanted to change the inlet angle of attack, you would have to change the airfoil angle of attack because you can't really change, like if you were to keep the airfoil still at zero degrees, respectively compared to the domain, you'd have to then change the inlet flow to let's say five degrees, which means that at the bottom, the corner there would have like this, this separation zone, which really messes with your results. Alternatively, if you make the inlet circular, 
you can keep the airfoil at zero degree angle tax of the geometry, but then you can change the inlet flow angle to whatever you want. And you don't have to worry about that, um, that separation around that corner because there is no corner. So the flow can come in nicely. That's why we do that. And this is very common, especially for typical applications of airfoils between like, let's say zero degrees and 20 degree angle tax. We don't change the airfoil geometry. We change the inlet flow angle. And this is just an easy way of doing it. So, and then they have the mesh um, of this, this airfoil and they have a really fine mesh. So they have a really nice boundary layer mesh. We'll get into in a second. And in the riblets, they have a very um, refined zone as well. So they say, Four different grid models with increasing grid quantity are built and simulated via three kinds of two equation terminus models in order to verify the accuracy of the SST K omega model and the grid convergence. So let's talk about this. I've talked about terminus models a lot in the past in previous podcasts, for example, podcast on 100. But here, we're just going to talk about the terminus model. We're using RANS here and it's steady. So it's not URANS, it's just regular RANS. And we are using a terminus model called SST K Omega, which is one of my favorites. Um, alternative models are K Epsilon, for example, K Omega, SST, just about the K, K Omega, whatever. Uh, uh, SA spelled Amaris. Uh, they're all different types of terminus models. And this is a way of modeling turbulence. So you're not actually simulating the turbulence properly. You're using a stochastic method to say, okay, there's this much turbulence in this general region. We're not going to um, worry ourselves as to the exact uh, details of this turbulence. We're just saying that that's the general turbulence here. That's what these models do. And that's all you can really do with RANS approaches. You can't really model turbulence properly. You have to go to LES and DNS to do that. So they're looking at three different types of terminus models. Uh, one thing that I should mention is they say two equation terminus models. This is TK Omega. It's not exactly two equations, it's more like five but it sort of falls into the category of K omega, which is a two equation terms model. Secondly, they talk about the grid convergence. So this is important where you want to change the number of grid points you have, which we'll get into in a second to see how robust your simulation is. They say the grid node in the streamwise direction increases from 335 to 793, while the grid node increases, or the node increases from 101 to 561 in the all normal direction. The minimum grid spacing on the airfoil is 0 0.0002 times the cord, located at both the leading edge and the trailing edges. The first layer height is controlled at 0 0.00005 times the cord to ensure a Y plus is less than one. And this is very important, especially for airfoils in the transitional reference number range. You want to have a Y plus less than one so that you can accurately um, simulate the flow the terminus models typically work best when you have a Y plus less than one. There are some terminus models where you can use a higher Y plus, but they're usually bad terminus models anyway. So don't worry about that. Just get a Y plus less than one and you're, you're fine usually. The grid spacing growth rate decreases from 1.15 for the coarse mesh to 1.03 for the fine mesh. So what this means is when you're at the surface, you want to have what's called an inflation layer or a boundary layer mesh, whatever you call it. This is where at the surface, you have the first layer of the cells then you have another layer above that, then another layer above that, and they're all very fine. But the thing is, they start growing in their height. So the first one, let's say you have a one millimeter uh, height of that cell. The second one will be one millimeter times by your growth rate. So in this case, 1.15 to 1.03, depending on whether you have a coarse mesh or a fine mesh. Now, obviously one millimeter, um, one, a one millimeter height for the first cell is quite large, but I'm just using that so it's easy to conceptualize. So that's what this means with the different coarse mesh, the different mesh um, inflation layer rates, uh, growth rates. So for the fine mesh, they're growing very slowly, which means you need to have more layers. And that typically means that it's going to be a better mesh. So in table one, they have a list coefficient comparison of the different terminus models and grid numbers at various angles of attack. The first thing that I'd like to note is that they range from, as I mentioned, a grid um, like a, a grid resolution of 101 times uh, 335 so they have 101 cells in one direction and 335 cells in the other direction which is only an uh, entire domain of 34,000 cells which is very uh, few like you can do that simulation in like probably five minutes on a regular computer then they range all the way up to 361 by 679 which is a uh, the domain has about 240,000 cells now that's still a very um, easy domain to calculate like you can do that on a computer in probably about 20 minutes, not even maybe. So 
that's beneficial in this case because they have a whole bunch of Terminus models uh, from RNG capsule to SST Camiga at different angles of attack for different resolutions for the mesh. So it's a very comprehensive study here, which is quite nice for this. They say in table one, it provides the list coefficients of the four grids achieved by the three Terminus models at different angles of attack, as well as the experimental data measured by um, a couple of researchers. So that's nice. You get not only the grid resolution independence um, study, you also get the experimental validation data there as well. For the same grid scheme, it can be seen that the lift coefficients solved by the SSTK Omega are the closest to the results of the experimental data, and those of the renormalized group K epsilon model are the worst. So the RNG K epsilon is the worst. Therefore, SSTK Omega model is sufficiently accurate to solve the two-dimensional float around the airfoil. Except for the results of the coarsest grid, so the 101 times 335, so that's uh, 33,000 or 34,000 um, cells in your domain. Except for this coarse mesh, coarse, mess, <laughs> coarse mesh, the lift coefficients of the other three grid schemes are close to the experimental data as small angles of attack. However, the difference between the simulation data and experimental data grows with increased angle of attack. So let's focus on this SST Camiga one first. At zero ground attack, the this coefficient is very similar to the experimental. It's within like 1%. In fact, it's probably even better than that. When you go to 4.5 degrees, again, it's still very close. It's within 1% easily. But when you get to 16 degrees, now you get an error of even about 2%, even at the best mesh um, resolution. So that's to be expected because you start to get stool there and that's harder to predict than a relief um, attached flow. So they're using the SST Cam Omega here, which they have not only looked at the grid independence um, aspect, which is good, they picked a grid um, that is independent of uh, the grid. So you can get a constant lift coefficient and drag coefficient, I guess, with um, different angles of attack. But it also is validated against the experiment quite well, up until about eight degrees is very good, or maybe let's say 4.5 degrees, and then eight degrees starts to get a little bit worse, and then it gets uh, worse from there. But the angles of attack are fine. And in figure three, it shows the error between the calculated results of different grid numbers and experimental values at two angles of attack. So at uh, 12 degrees and 16 degrees. As the grid number increases, the error continuously decreases. When the grid number exceeds 271 by 563, the deviation can, can be controlled within 3.4%. However, there is no significant improvement in the prediction accuracy of the lift coefficients when the grid number further increases. So in other words, that's the point where you don't really need to get any more grid points because then you're just wasting resources in terms of calculating additional information which you don't need. You're not, in not increasing the accuracy of your results. So it's best just to go for this grid and save computational power and resources. However, oh, sorry, as a result, the SST Cam Mega model at a grid number of 271 by 563 are finally considered as a terminus model and mesh model in this study. So they're concluding that. They say, although the riblets are microstructures compared to the entire airfoil, they significantly affect the flow characteristics of the airfoil. Therefore, the grid independence of the riblets was also tested based on this grid validation method in order to accurately simulate the flow field details. So this is very good. I'm very impressed with their safety validation approach here. They're not only doing a grid independence model, which is a study, sorry, which is what you should do. They're also doing a um, terminus model study as well, looking at different terminus models that you can use, which is very nice. They're also using different, they're also using, sorry, using validation data from experiments. That's very good too. And now they're looking at the, the riblets as well to see if they can validate that CFD. So they're doing a very thorough job here. So they say, um, the grid number in the riblets was different while the rest of the computational domain was held at 271 by a certain amount. So in other words, they're looking at how many, um, cells you need to have in the riblets in order to have a um, mesh independent CFD. So they have the rest of the domain, which they're holding constant at a certain amount of cells, but then in the riblets, they're putting more or less in and seeing how that affects the results. So that's really cool. They, um, this results in the grid number in each riblet is either between 10 to 20. So you can either have 10 number, 10 cells in there or 20 cells in one direction, and then they pack them um, in the same boundary layer, inflation layers. And they have the lift coefficients of different schemes at various angles of attacks at around 100,000. And then figure four, they have the results here. So they have the lift coefficient of these um, different mesh resolutions in these riblets for different angles of attack from zero degrees to 12 degrees. 
and they say um, figure four shows that the lift coefficients of each scheme, so each resolution, are basically identical at small angle attack, and the tendency is consistent. So the the um, the trend. However, the difference grows when the increase in angle attack increases. So when the grid number in each riblet is 16 or 20, the lift coefficient remains unchanged, indicating that the rib riblet, sorry, the riblet grid number is sufficient at 16 or 20. Therefore, the grid number on the single riblet is 16 as a height of one millimeter, and it increases in equal proportion to the enlargement in H. So in other words, uh, when they held the height of the riblet at one millimeter, they found that 16 cells is sufficient to have a mesh independence. Um, but when you start to increase the height of the riblet, you then need to put in more cells to fill that um, extra height. And they're using this exact same cell height to just do that. Thus, to ensure the same grid topology and grid density, the grid numbers of the two dimensional calculations are modeled as 271 by 563, so the original airfoil, plus additional cells in the riblet area. So it's a quite a nice um, uh, grid independent study there. So let's move on to the results, analysis, and discussion. And I should probably mention that we won't get through all this paper in this podcast because we have a lot of results to cover. We'll get through the first little bit and then the second podcast in one o podcast on 102. We'll go through the second half of this uh, paper with the results there. So let's talk about first the flow characteristics of the riblets inside the boundary layer. They say that several there are uh, several kinds of riblets with different lengths are discussed in this section. So the L70, which means that you have a height of um, one millimeter and you have the riblets covering 70% of the upper surface of the airfoil. This scheme is taken as an example to explore the influence of the riblets on the flow characteristics inside the airfoil boundary layer. Table two shows this. So they found that the amelioration of the lift coefficient and the ratio of lift to drag are significant. So in other words, when you have this, these riblets on this airfoil, as you go to high angles of attack, these things perform even better. So at zero degree angle attack, the lift is increased by 7% or 7.6%. The drag is reduced by about 0.3%. Uh, so the, the lift to drag ratio increases by 8%. But when you get to 12 degree angle attack, <laughs> this is amazing. So the lift not only increases by 15%, the drag would re reduces by 15%, which means that the lift to drag ratio is now 37% higher. These riblets achieve that on this airfoil. So that's amazing. In figure five, this compares the velocity profiles of the streamlined location, streamlined location among the four schemes at an angle attack of 12 degrees from 10% um, from the leading edge all the way to 80% of the leading edge, um, the cord, sorry. So you, they start just after the leading edge and go almost all the way to the trailing edge. They say the abscissa is the, so the, the um, Y axis is a non-dimensional velocity at the assigned location and the Y ordinate is the wall normal distance from the airfoil wall. So in other words, this is a typical boundary layer profile we have on the X axis, you have a normalized um, velocity compared to the friction velocity. Then the Y axis is just a distance from the wall. And they say that the leading edge vortex, the leading separation vortex and the trailing separation vortex are clear at uh, locations 0 0.1 and 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. So in other words, the leading edge vortex which they found, I don't know why this occurs here yet, but uh, we'll see later on in the next podcast. There is a leading edge vortex that occurs on this airfoil. And they found that it happens here at the, just after the, the leading edge, which makes sense. It's at 10% uh, from the leading edge uh, there. And you can see this in the boundary layer profile because there's this massive inflection point in the velocity. Then once you go past that, the boundary layer profile becomes very similar to effectively a turbulent boundary layer. But then when you get to a when you get to just past the halfway point on the F wall, they start to get this inflection point again, which happens to be um, due to the trailing separation vortex. So that's what we can see in these, uh, these figures here. Now moving on to figure six, we now have a bit of a taste as to what these riblets do to the flow. So they say figure six shows the streamlines and pressure contours of the L70 scheme at the different locations of the riblets under the condition of 12 degree angle attack. So L70 is again, you have a riblet height of one millimeter and they cover 70% of the cord of the airfoil. The selected riblets are located at the position prior to the trailing separation vortex 
the starting position of the trailing separation vortex and the position, position inside the trailing separation vortex. The vortex of the riblets, so the vortices created by the riblets, and the minor vortices below the, these vortices are formed due to the microstructures of the riblets. Before the starting point of the trailing separation vortex, the vortex of the riblets is inside the riblet. So in other words, there, there's a lot of riblets and vortices I'm saying here. It's pretty confusing. Let me break this down for you. They have a few different locations they're looking at along this airfoil to see what the flow is doing, these streamlines. They have one location, which is about halfway um, down the airfoil. And there is no um, leading edge or no separation, a trailing edge vortex happening here. This is just these um, riblets are just by themselves and they produce vortices inside their structures, inside their troughs. Each vortex produces this uh, very strong vortex effect. This, each riblet, sorry, produces a very strong vortex. And this is what helps control the boundary layer, helps suppress that um, turbulence. Then they have another uh, location, which is just before the trailing separation vortex. And then they have another location, which is inside the trailing separation vortex. So they want to see how this vortex affects the riblets, this, mi this macroscopic vortex affecting these mesoscopic vortices. So they say, when flow separation arises, the riblet vortex moves upwards and invades the, main the mainstream. So in other words, when you don't have any macroscopic vortex, so this trailing separation vortex occurring, these vortices inside the riblets just stay where they are. They don't move into the free stream. But when these riblets are inside this trailing suppression vortex, so there's, there's this, this macroscopic vortex happening, the vortices inside the riblets start to migrate into the free stream, into at least this vortex, which makes sense from a couple of different reasons. The first reason is that a trailing separation vortex is low pressure, which means that you have this low pressure sucking these vortices out. Secondly, the free stream is um, going to be sucking these vortices out through simple entrainment, really. So that's another reason there as well. And even the, the vortex as well is going to be sucking these out through, through entrainment as well. So they say, as the airfoil trailing separation vortex was adequately developed, the fluid with a reverse velocity gradient occupies most of the riblet. And the riblet vortex is a certain distance away from the riblet. So it moves very far away. So that's in this podcast. We're not going to go any further here. In the next podcast, we're going to look at different things such as the effect of the riblets on with different lengths and um, different heights and all that. And we're going to do that in podcast on 102, which is going to come out in a few days from now. So make sure to like, subscribe this and check out our courses and theory on um, CFT. You can find them in the link description. And if you want to get your experiments better, make it more accurate by two to four percent and make your validation data for your CFD more accurate as we found here they've done a very good CFD analysis and if you want to do something similar to this you need to make sure that your validation data is accurate to do that you need to measure the density of the air that you're using during your CF during your experiment sorry the reason why that is is because if you're using the different density of air in your experiments compared to your CFD they're not going to match up obviously and you're going to get very different results and it doesn't matter how much you try to validate the data there's going to be an error the atmosphere hawk, which is an instrument we make, accurately measures the density of air for you, so you get rid of that error. And the reason why I say it's 2 to 4% is because that's how much the density of air changes on any regular day. So if you walk into your uh, wind tunnel at 9 a.m., the density of air will be one thing. When you come back from lunch, it'll be another thing. When you're just about to leave to go home, it'll be another thing. And that range is about 2 to 4% every day. When you go from day to day or week to week or month to month or season to season, it gets even worse than that. It can be like 15% difference. So the atmosphere hawk gets rid of that error for you and you can get that instrument in the link description and I'll see you in the next podcast. Peace out, amigos. 